So I'm going to skip these uh, for the sake of time and get to the principal agent problem, which is the way that uh, people in social sciences, in economics, but also in other social sciences, <coughs> think around this issue of uh, getting somebody to do something on your behalf. Because parents are asking the school system to do something on their behalf. The state is asking the schools to provide something on their behalf. So uh, we have this problem that the inputs and the outputs that we spoke about, we can measure them both, but the question is how are they related? They're related through the way in which things ha happen at the school level. Uh, and uh, this takes us to the principal agent problem. The principal agent problem, according to this definition of Stiglitz, whose name you'll come across very often nowadays, uh, is how one, in, and I'll quote him, how one individual, the principal, and it's not a school principal, we call somebody who wants to get somebody else to do work on his behalf or on her behalf, we call such a person a principal. So the principle, how he can design a compensation system or contract or compact which motivates another individual, the agent, for instance an employee, to act in the principal's interest. So you want to have people acting in the interest of the principal. Uh, so if I'm a parent, I want teachers to, uh, to act in my interest. My interest is to get a good education for my child. How, what do I do? What sort of relationship do I establish which helps me to do that? And what relationship does a state uh, establish? So uh, our problem here is in measuring effort and outcomes. And I'm going to give you some definitions uh, simply to show you that different people uh, talk about this thing in quite different contexts before we move to the education, uh, education sphere. Uh, and I don't know whether you have copies of this because I'm not so sure how well you can read it. Uh, right. Uh, this is a quote from uh, from Menard and Shirley. Uh, sorry, from Miller uh, in the book of Menard and Shirley. They say there are many settings in which one economic actor, the principal, delegates authority to an agent to act on her behalf. The primary, re primary reason for doing so is that the agent has an advantage in terms of expertise or information. Right. So if you want to have somebody fix your car or mend your teeth or do an operation on you, you give it over to, an, to somebody who's acting on your behalf. The doctor or the dentist or the mechanic, they're all acting on your behalf. You want to make sure they do what you would have done if you could, do it, could have done it yourself. But they have the information. They know what's necessary. They know whether it really is necessary to, uh, to give you an operation, uh, uh, remove the engine, uh, do whatever is required. Okay, so they know what's necessary. They have the information. You don't necessarily have that information. So that's the first problem. It's what we call the asymmetry in information. The information I have is not the information they have. Uh, this informational advantage or information asymmetry poses a problem for the principal, the person who wants to have something done. How can the principal be sure that the agent has in fact acted in her best interest? I can't know whether when somebody tells me that my car has to be taken apart and then put together again three times, I can't know whether that's actually necessary because I know nothing about cars. That's a very good example I must tell you. Uh, so then how do you deal with it? The question is you try to have a contract or you try to establish a relationship of trust in the long run with somebody, which is in a sense a, a type of contract or compact. Uh, can a contract be written defining incentives in such a way that the principal can be assured that the agent is taking just the ac action that she would take had she the information available to the agent? If you arrive in a city in, uh, that you don't know and you take a taxi, what's the right way to compensate the taxi? To compensate him for how quickly he gets there, then you're going to 
have uh, quite a trip. Uh, do you compensate for how long it takes to get there? In which case you're going to have to see quite a lot of the city. Uh, do you compensate according to the distance? Do you compensate according to what criteria? How you set the incentives determines how the agent would react. Same thing applies else in, in, in other areas also. So it's continuing that issue of setting the incentives. Uh, so they mentioned some examples where this would apply. Uh, here's another one which I think is uh, you can read later when you've got the full, the full text. Uh, is uh, but let's get to the South African uh, uh, to, to the education situation. Perhaps just as one quote still on on uh, health. This is from a Vietnamese study uh, where the person says a principal agent problem in health and healthcare asserts that providers will act to maximize their profits at the expense of the patient's interests. So providers, those who have to, uh, the doctors, the nurses, the uh, specialists, they act in their interests and their interest is not necessarily the same as the patient's. Okay. So this problem is applies especially where professional regulations are lacking and incentives exist to directly link providers' actions to their profits, such as a fee for service payment system. So if I'm paid according to how many services I provide, I'm going to provide as many services as possible. If I'm paid for how difficult the operation is that I have to undertake, I'm going to undertake that operation sometimes even when it may not quite be necessary. Uh, the current analysis tests for the existence of the principal agent problem in the private health market in Vietnam by examining the prescribing patterns of private providers. And this is what he found. Uh, I show that private pro providers were able to induce demand by prescribing more drugs than pri public providers for some of the Ill illness and patient profile. So because you prescribing the drugs yourself, you would prescribe more drugs than somebody in a government hospital would do. Okay. Uh, secondly, uh, that private providers were significantly more likely to prescribe injection drugs to gain trust amongst the patients. And thirdly, patients' education as a source of information and empowerment. I want to get back to that. Patients' information as a source of in, uh, pa patients' education as a source of information <coughs> and empowerment has enabled them to mitigate the demand inducement by the providers. We think back the short and long route. Uh, and we spoke about client power, about parent power. That parent power is greater when you have more educated parents. When you have so the patient's education, the parent's education, allow them to have more information. They're in a stronger position relative to the teachers, and therefore they can put more uh, pressure on the system. So you're, if you're in a middle class school as a teacher, you've got a difficult time because the parents will be pestering you all the time. If you're in a poor school, the parents don't know what they can expect of you. They're in a position of powerless towards, uh, to, uh, towards the teachers, and the situation is quite different. Okay, so let's think then about the principal agent problem in education. And here you have to come in. Firstly, who is the principal? parents, right? That would be one principle, but one could also look at it from different perspectives, okay? So the parents would obviously be one principle. What would be the other principle? Another potential principle? The state. The state, so the state wants to have teachers act in a certain way. Parents want to, uh, want to act, have <coughs> teachers act in a certain way. So they're the principles. But, uh, in this case then, the, uh, the agents in the case of the state, are clearly the teachers. When you talk about the agents, when the parent is the principal, who is the agent? It could be the teachers, but it could also be all of us, all of us involved in the education system, because in a sense, they want us to act on their behalf. Right. Okay, so we have to think of that as from both a perspective as when we have a state then we are the principal and we have to get 
the teachers to act in a certain way, but also when there is pressure from below, where there's pressure through the political system, that's when we are the, uh, the agents uh, and we have to deal, deal with those issues. So that's the, uh, those are the first questions. What asymmetries of information are there? Or put it differently, what information is there that we lack but that teachers have, for instance, uh, and that would be necessary for us to, to hold teachers accountable? What information do we require? Information about the uh, learner's abilities. Right, information about the learner's ability. So often teachers would say to you, but uh, yes, I have had horrible results, but with this group of children you can't do anything. Okay. We don't know whether that's true. You simply, all information that you have come, uh, comes from the teacher. So you have, you have a problem there. Information about the learner's ability, therefore. What else? What other information <coughs> does a teacher have, which we don't have? Content knowledge, right, so the teacher knows what needs to be done and parents don't know it, right. So, uh, but that takes us to something else. Very important information in this regard is how much does a teacher actually do to, to get this content knowledge across? How hard does a teacher work? What, uh, how much of the, of the curriculum is covered? Uh, how, uh, how much homework does a teacher give? How much of that is, uh, is, uh, is marked? How much feedback is there to, uh, is there to the children, etc.? Parents get a little bit of information about this. But largely, and particularly when, teen when you, you parents of teenage children, you don't get any information anymore. Uh, but largely, we, parents are lost in this, uh, in this game. They are at a position of disadvantage relative to the teachers. How do we turn it around? So, I'm not going to answer the question, but I'm going to add, I'm just going to make a comment. Sometimes it's very difficult, even for the agents, the teachers themselves. No. Because sometimes they don't know the extent, because of their context, or their, I'm not making excuses for mm. Because of the burden of just teaching children who are coming to school hungry, they're in a much structure, it's just difficult to teach a group of 50 children, 45 children, or whatever. They might not actually have the information that they should have to be able to, to just to say, these ones are like this, this ones are like this, this ones are like that. So I think yeah. I'm just adding to the complexity of the question. Precisely. Yes, uh, that, 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 that you're absolutely right. And in, in this context, very often what the teacher has to do is, is to sort of take the, the route of least resistance. Mm. Uh, and often that is, uh, in another context, one re would refer to it as satisficing, uh, all of that. Uh, and in other words, trying to make the best of a situation without necessarily being doing the optimal thing. Uh, but just trying to keep everybody broadly happy and not have too much difficulties. But then the question is, under what incentives do teachers operate? Okay. And those incentives are set by the nature of the principal-agent relationship. Okay. So if we don't have contracts where you measure what teachers are doing, uh, it's very difficult to hold them accountable. On the other hand, to get such contracts is so complex uh, that it might not be possible. So we have to find in between this, we have to find ways of trying to deal with it. And the sort of information that we're going to uh, talk about then in the course of this course is uh, things such as Anna. How do we, what does Anna do? How do we use it? We're going to talk about the metric results and the, uh, uh, the examinations within the schools, the continuous examination. And we're going to ask, what information does that give us about the ability of the teachers to assess? What information does it give us about how the schools operate? 
how do we use that information as an indicator to help us? Uh, and then there's a question, is there a contract or contract compact or a way in which there is an understanding that uh, teachers have to do certain things? And I'm always, I'm now talking at the level of the school because I think that's where all of it ends. But of course, the same thing applies if you, the head of a group of people working on a particular thing, those working for you are your agents and you have exactly the same uh, problem at different points. But at the school level, the, the question is, what ways do we have of enforcing the implicit contract? Because it's an implicit contract that teachers will be doing their best within certain constraints. And if they aren't, what are we doing about it and is there a way of dealing with it? And that means that we need to have some sort of sanctions and rewards, some sort of incentives. When we talk about incentives, we don't always mean additional money. We talk about uh, uh, things such as money, rewards, but also a pat on the back is sometimes a, as important an incentive as a money may, may be. On the other hand, being uh, 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 when it is made clear that you're not doing your job and that becomes evident to, to more people, that's a sanction. That's something that, that hurts. Uh, and it's those sort of incentives that what one has to think about. Uh, just quoting from uh, Bruns et al. Incentive systems in education face a challenge that is common to most sectors and firms. In other words, it's not a unique problem to education. It's a more general problem, the principal agent problem. The principal, the country's ministry of education, that's one way of dealing with it, although we said the parents could also be the principal, could look at it differently, would like to ensure that its agents, the school directors, that's in our case the school principals, uh, and teachers deliver schooling that results in learning. But achieving this, and that's Carol's point also, achieving this is complex because of the nature of the service. It's not so easy, not everybody knows exactly what to do to improve teaching. Teachers may not be in a position to improve teaching. So let's get to uh, the role of information and accountability, which takes us into the gist of the topic. Uh, again, quoted from Bruns, when parents and students have little information about the performance of their schools or about the inputs that the, those schools are entitled to receive, their position relative to service providers and governments is weak. They have limited ability to hold schools and teachers accountable for either effort or efficiency. And they have a limited empirical foundation to lobby local or national government. Uh, so information is crucial in order to empower people, to empower the agents, uh, sorry, to empower the principals. Uh, so we have now throughout the world a, an accountability movement in starting to operate in, uh, in many education systems. Uh, and issues arising from that relate to the roles and responsibilities, school inputs, the financing side of it, and many of the indicators we'll be looking at touch on those. Are there school books delivered in uh, to schools in particular circumstances? The input side, but also the outputs or the outcomes the test scores, uh, socioeconomic status, uh, whether that's considered, uh, student and parent satisfaction, those are all part of the information that one can deal with. Uh, so you need to collect the information, you need to analyze it, and you need to disseminate it. Data only becomes useful, it only becomes information after it has been analyzed, after it has gone through a process. And that is partly what, uh, or this sort of longer course that we're talking about, is about. So uh, let's look at the forms of reporting. One can have report cards, so report cards for students, for schools, for regions at the national level. You could have a ranking system of schools which has its own problems. Uh, you could have press reports as a way of dealing with it and sometimes these press reports uh, happen without necessarily uh, anybody playing uh, or anybody within the education system playing a role in it. All of this can influence accountability and it can affect learning outcomes in different ways. It can affect it through choice. So people may decide 
on the basis of the information they get, they're going to move uh, to take their child from one school to another. Right, that's one set of information on which people can, can react. If that happens on a large enough scale, it may put pressure on the system and therefore lead to some, uh, some changes, some improvement in the weaker schools. You can have participation, parent involvement in the process, uh, which comes from this information. You can have voice, that's parents saying to the political, uh, to the political uh, policy makers, uh, we are unhappy with the situation, you have to do something about the schools. And you see it in terms of service delivery protests, that's a form of voice. Uh, but the little protests we've seen in education, uh, service delivery protests, have all been aimed at what? They've largely been aimed at things, at, at infrastructure and at textbooks. They have not been aimed at what's happening in the classroom. So if one puts right the infrastructure and you put right the textbooks, it may improve things a little in the classroom. But the real problem we know is what happens or does not happen in many classrooms. And how much can we improve on it with the existing body of people we have. And then, of course, information can also be used in the management process. And all of you are engaged in that. You know that well enough. Uh, it's useful to think of information f as uh, be playing two roles. So one is some people think information in itself is what brings you accountability, simply by making the information available. So it focuses on the use of information uh, as an instrument of change. And others say information should be seen as an input into incentives of systems. So for instance, some would say you need performance agreements. Those performance agreements require information to see whether people actually keep to the agreement. But if you have a, a performance agreement and information, you also need some sanctions if people don't keep to the agreement or rewards if they do. Uh, and then the question is, how do schools react? Uh, it depends on how strong the pressure is. So if parents put a lot of pressure on the schools, maybe you'll get a strong reaction. Uh, if the pressure is less, probably less. But there's also the question, how much can teachers do? If you're a weakly educated teacher, if you did not do mathematics yourself at school because you did not like it at mathematics and now you're teaching mathematics, how much can one expect of you in terms of improving your, uh, improving your your behavior in terms of in terms of what happens in the classroom <coughs> covering the curriculum teaching children uh, properly and also if you uh, say the, that schools should react to the information it assumes that they've got some discretion it assumes that they can decide what they want to do but very often schools can't uh, right uh, quite a lot and perhaps some of it uh, still too uh, general so I finally want to end with a few things just looking at accountability uh, and then we can take it into into more open discussion uh, according to uh, what we've seen South Africa is a few decades behind in terms of accountability uh, if one compares us to the OECD countries and also some developing countries Stage one, according to the way Lovelace sees it, is that you set the standards. You define what students should learn. That's an important aspect in accountability. And you could say that CAPS is doing that. Okay? So we've, we've covered CAPS sta stage one in that sense. Of course, one can still improve on some aspects of it, but it broad uh, brush thing is there. The second stage is me measuring achievement testing to see what students have learned. Uh, and here one would think of the ANA as being that. Before the ANA, all we had was matric results. How did we know whether primary schools were doing their job? We didn't. We had no way of measuring. Now at least one has that potentially. Uh, and then the third would be holding teachers and students accountable, and schools, uh, one should add, so in other words, making results count. And in order to do that, 
you need some things such as performance agreements or some accountability structures uh, that the school commits to performing at a certain level or improving to a certain level and there has to be some way of monitoring that and of, of, of uh, uh, incentivizing that. Uh, just then running ahead uh, on things we're going to look at again on Thursday, how do we report on performance? You can have school reports, student reports, school posters for instance. Here is a, uh, at the provincial level is a uh, categorization, categorization of how schools perform uh, in terms, for instance, uh, in terms of, of ANA. So it's one way of reporting. Okay? It gives us indicators, it tells us that different provinces have different levels. Uh, now, as I said, not all schools were covered, so it's not, it's not fully representative of the country, but it gives us an idea. idea. Uh, we can go down to the district level and say which education districts, and here we use the uh, we use KwaZulu Natal, which is one of the uh, district, uh, one of the provinces where we had more of the schools captured, and one can see that at the district level we can now uh, distinguish and find out which districts are performing better or performing worse. So it's some uh, indicators that tell us uh, tell us a little more. We can then go to the school level, taking an actual school in the Western Cape, Ashbury Primary, and we say that for Ashbury Primary, let's compare it. Let's tell Ashbury Primary as a school how they're doing. So you can say, on average, this is how they're doing in each grade. How does it compare to the Western Cape average? It's a Western Cape school. How does it compare to the district average, the Cape Winders? How does it compare to other Quintal Free schools? Uh, and we can see, for instance, that generally speaking, Ashbury Primary is compared to other Quintal Free schools. It's roughly doing as one would expect, except it's doing quite considerably better here in grades three and four. And if you look at the numeracy, again, in grades three and four, Ashbury Primary seems to be doing very well compared to other schools. Okay. So it gives us information, it tells us something about that school. We have to find ways of using that information. That is, uh, is the issue here. One can go further and you can take an individual child and uh, obviously we did not present the real name of the child. Uh, but this is a hypothetical child. It is actually an actual child but we've given him another name. Uh, Peter Jacobs in Ashbury Primary and we say his mathematics score was only 20%, his reading score was 45%. This is how it compares to others in the school. This is how it compares to the Western Cape average. This is how it compares to the quintile, etc. So lots of information that one can make available and that would give parents that information which they require for accountability, for holding schools, holding the system accountable. Uh, then we can also provide it in another way. We can provide a school poster. This school poster says that if we take 50% as a level at which people should be operating, if we say that's the criterion that you should be aiming for, 64 out of 105 learners in grade one are operating at that level. But none of the learners in grade six are operating at that level. Doesn't mean that the problem lies in the grade six teachers. It lies somewhere on the way perhaps to grade six. But it tells, it tells parents, look, there's something wrong in the school and that something is particularly problematic in the maths. Uh, what is the school doing about it? And then the school is uh, the school is being held accountable to the parents, to the community, and uh, that is where uh, where one gets uh, where one starts with the process of accountability. Right, uh, lots of words, too much of it uh, at the theoretical level. 
We're going to become much more practical in the course of uh, these four days. Uh, I think now I should ask for questions and inputs before we, uh, we break and then we move to the second session. <laughs>